we are very sensitive and, and intentional when it comes to having conversations about faith, and so we recognize as you walk in that pretty much everyone's in the room walking in at different places in their spiritual journey. And so I don't know where you walked in with, but I want you to know it's an honor that you're here. We have great respect for your time, and we also want to meet you where you are. And so maybe you walked in and you're feeling spiritually disconnected from God, or, or you would classify yourself as spiritually disconnected, and maybe you're trying to figure out what it means to maybe change that. Or maybe you walked in and you would call yourself spiritually interested, and you say, you know what, I'm on this journey, and I'm trying to figure it out, and I'm trying to understand uh, what this relationship with God means, or, or if that's even possible. Or maybe you came in and you would classify yourself as spiritually alive or spiritually growing, and we want you to know, man, no matter where you find yourself today, we believe there's next steps for everyone in the room, and we would consider it an honor to be able to walk with you on that journey. And so let me build some groundwork for you today as we have this conversation, uh, just to get everybody on the same page. And so I think most everyone in the room would agree that Jesus was a historical figure. That's not really being debated anymore. He was a real guy who really lived, who really died, who really taught, and did some really good things. I think everyone would agree with that. At the same time, I think everyone in the room would agree that Jesus lived a life worth modeling. He, he, had, he had a life that was uh, to be learned from, and it was a good life. He needed some good things. But maybe you're here and we get to this Easter Sunday conversation, and again, I don't know where you're walking in with, but there are Christians all over the world today celebrating a singular event in history that changed everything, and that's the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And maybe you're here, and you say, you know what, Drake, that's where... I have a hard time. I might have to draw the line. It seems like it's really hard to swallow. I mean, I mean, yes, a good person. Yes, did some awesome things and, and taught some really good things, but, but resurrecting from the dead, like that's, that's pretty far out there. And maybe you think of it like Jesus says this fish story. Like, I don't know if you like to fish, but you know, you went on a fishing trip and when you actually caught the fish, it was this big. And by the time you got back and started sharing that story, the fish was this big. And then over a couple millennia, the fish is this big. And you're like, Jesus is kind of like a fish story. Great guy. It's just been blown out of proportion. And now, you know, this resurrection thing, I, I think it's maybe a little far out there and I have a hard time believing it. If that's you in the room, I want you to know you are in good company. Because all of Jesus' followers and first century friends were struggling with the same doubts no one was anticipating a resurrection. I think you hear, if you've been around church or, or religion at all, maybe you've heard of, of this Easter Sunday as Jesus is alive and you hear people say it or they post it on social media. I want you to know the day that Easter Sunday rolled around, there were not a huge crowd of followers outside of the tomb that Jesus was buried in watching the sun come above the hill and counting down 10, 9, 8, someone get your phone out, hurry, get this on the gram, 7, 6, that wasn't happening. Everyone was scared out of their minds. They had just been following someone for three years. Now he's dead, and now they're open season for them, and so they're hiding in homes. No one is looking for a resurrection. Everyone's scared and confused. And so if you find yourself in that category, I want you to know you probably find yourself in good company. And so the day that Jesus was murdered on a cross, all of his followers were expecting Jesus to do what dead people normally do and that's stay dead, okay, <laughs> right? And so uh, what I want to do is have a conversation uh, around this really hard-to-believe miracle that Christians all over the world are celebrating today. And so I want to go back to the morning after Jesus was bur murdered in Mark chapter 16. It'll be on the screen for you. Let me show you. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath had ended, so the Jews at the time, they have a Sabbath where they're not allowed to work. And so Saturday evening after the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could go anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who's going to roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And as they arrived, they looked up, and they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. So a couple of things. Th they're, they're gathering spices for his body. Listen, this was not an essential oils care package. 
to Jesus because they know he'd been in a stinky tomb for three days and he probably needed a shower, right? They weren't just sending a care package to Jesus to help him freshen up. Here's the events that happened. Thursday night, late in the evening, Jesus was arrested and wrongfully trialed. By Friday morning, they're watching the guy they had been following for three years be murdered on a cross. They're shocked. They're confused. It's all happening so fast. And by the time we get to Saturday, they have not had time to properly take care of Jesus' body. So the women, who are some of his followers, are heading to the tomb to go take care of his body properly. They watched him die. They watched two men carry him from the cross to this tomb. They watched them wrap his body in linen and then close the stone in front of this tomb and put armed guards in front of it so that no one could steal the body. They watched all of this happen and are now on the way to take care of it. And the reason this is important is I want you to see they're not expecting a resurrection. They're not expecting Jesus to pop out and go take a shower and hang out with his friends. They're expecting that he's dead just like they saw him dead on Friday. And let me show you the next verse. So they run back, verse 20. John and uh, 20, verse 2, it says that Mary runs back and finds some of the other followers of Jesus who are hiding in a home. So Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that's John. These are Jesus' really close friends. She runs back and she says, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. What is she saying? Someone's stolen the body, right? Even, even when Jesus and his body is gone, she's not like, he's alive. She's like, someone took him. <laughs> Where is the body? And then watch the response in the next verse, in Luke 24, verse 11. It says, but the story sounded like nonsense to the men in the room, and so they didn't believe it. I want you to know, there was no concept of a resurrection in the minds of Jesus' followers when they watched him die on Friday. Now watch what happens next in verse 12. Peter jumps up and he runs to the tomb. He doesn't believe him. He doesn't understand. And so he goes to check it out for himself. Not everyone leaves because it's open season on his followers. Their, their leader was just murdered. And so they're not going to be seen in public. And so he goes with John stooping. He peers in and he sees the empty linen wrappings. And then he went home again saying, Jesus is alive. No. What did he say? He, went, he goes home wondering what in the world happened. Right? Peter. The, one of the closest guys to Jesus goes home saying, what in the world happened to Jesus' body? And so if you find yourself having doubts, if you find yourself having a hard time with this, I want you to know you are in good company. Now here's what's really funny. Next, we're going to see them scared, hiding, confused in a house, and Jesus is going to show up alive to them. Watch what happens in, in verse uh, 37 here, but the whole group was startled when Jesus showed up and frightened. I think that's an understatement, right? Jesus, who, who they watched was murdered, walks in the home that they're hiding in, and they're startled, right? Do you remember, uh, maybe when you were a kid, if you're like me, uh, you were scared of the dark at times, and you know, you had those point A to point B destinations in the dark where you had to like, for me, it was like taking out the trash. So our trash was around the house, and you go out the back door and around to the side and put the trash in the garbage can, and at night, everything's really quiet and really creepy. And so as a little kid, what would you do? You'd go out and you'd run as fast as you can to the trash can, slam it in there. And then most of the time, because you're in a hurry, you knocked over the trash can. Now you got to scramble to pick it back up and run back inside really fast. Why? Because you're scared that something's going to get you. You know that feeling? I think that's what this, what's going on right here. Jesus walks in. They're like, ah! <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's not a, oh, hey, there you are. We were wondering when you were going to show up. No, they are scared out of their shorts. Verse 38, why are you frightened, Jesus says. And he asks, why are your hearts filled with doubt? And I think he says this with a smile. Why are you frightened? Because over and over again, before Jesus was murdered, he would say this kind of statement to them often. Why are you scared? Why are you frightened? And so I think he's smiling. And, and, and then he goes on, he says, look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. That's a good point, right? It's a good argument, okay? Verse 40, as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Watch what happens next. Then Jesus says in uh, verse 44, he says, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. He says, I told you this would happen. And the, the law and the prophets, if, if you've not been following, this is their sacred text for the Jewish people. 
And so all of their sacred texts, all of their scriptures, he says, all of that's been pointing to me. All of the things that you study, all the things that you've been looking into, it was all pointing to what I just did. I told you this would happen. I told you I would rise from the dead. I told you I would give my life in in place of humanity to bring them back into relationship with God. I told you this would happen. And what Jesus says to them next ultimately changes the world. It changes the course of their life. It changes the world as we know it today. Jesus says this. He says, you all, he's looking around the room, are witnesses of these things. You're witnesses of all of these things. Guys, this is so, so important. I don't know what you walked in with, but I want you to hear me when I say this. Here's the first and really the big idea of the day. It was the resurrection of Jesus that launched Christianity, and it was the resurrection of Jesus that launched the church. You need to hear this. It wasn't Jesus' teaching that started Christianity. It wasn't his, his good life and his model that launched the church. Listen, this is so important. The Bible did not create Christianity. The Bible did not launch the church. Before the resurrection, there were no Christians, After the death of Jesus that night on a Friday, there were no Christians. It is this singular event that Christians celebrate all over the world, the resurrection of Jesus that launches the church and launches Christianity. Everything pivots on this point. And the reason this is so important is because in this moment in time, nobody was expecting no body. That's good right there. Come on, that's good. You're like, I'll remember that, yeah. All right, here's another thing for you. The reason that we believe as Christians, the reason that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead is not because the Bible tells us so. And for the record, I I didn't grow up a Christian. I became a Christian at 15, and it's because of the singular event and what it means for me and what it means for the world around me that I became a follower of Jesus. And it's the reason we believe that he rose from the dead is not because a book tells us that, that it happened or that there's a sacred text that gives us this instruction. It's so much better than that. It's so much better than that. You see, at the time that Jesus, this, this event is happening, the Bible doesn't exist as we know it. The New Testament that we have are are historical documents of eyewitnesses, right? Jesus looked around the room and he says, you are a witness of what has happened. And the New Testament that we have in the Bible today are historical, verified documents of real, live eyewitnesses of these accounts. I'll give you a few. Matthew, one of Jesus' closest followers, part of his group, he was an eyewitness, wrote an an account in the book of Matthew. You You can check it out. Mark wrote down from Peter, All of the things that happened. Peter was one of his closest followers. Documented it all. Life, death, burial, everything that happened. Luke, really cool guy, investigated everything thoroughly. He was a medical doctor who was actually funded by someone else to do a thorough, in-depth search of all the things concerning Jesus. His life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. John, one of Jesus' closest friends, was an eyewitness documented the entire course of Jesus' life and events, ultimately would be boiled alive in oil for his faith in Jesus. Now listen, if Jesus died and he didn't get back up, I don't know that I'm willing to be boiled alive in oil, okay? But then he didn't die. I'm like, man, that stinks. (laughs) Should have died right then. He didn't die when they boiled him alive in oil, and so then they exiled him to an island for the rest of his life, and then he died there. That dude was hardcore, okay? Then you got Peter. Peter, I love Peter because he's so messed up. He's like me and you. Like, he's so relatable. And so Peter, who would ultimately, he would, sorry, I just insulted some of you. He's at least messed up like me. If you're honest, you're probably messed up too, okay? Some of you were like, right. We value consistent transparency here. And so, welcome to the club, okay? Um, (laughs) That was awesome. Peter. He, he uh, later writes letters to the church, but in the beginning, he actually denies he ever knew Jesus. And so later, he would actually be crucified upside down for his faith because he didn't consider it an honor to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was. That's a big deal. And then James, man, this is crazy. The brother of Jesus becomes a follower of Jesus. Now listen, I don't know what it takes to convince your brother that you're God, but probably a lot. Like, if it's me, like, a resurrection is a good start. Like, okay. 
Let's see. It's a good start, right? And so James, I think if you had a chance to talk to him today, he would say, you know what? I was there. I saw him die. I was there the day he was murdered. And then I saw him alive again. He says, you know what? I thought he was crazy. My whole family, we thought he was absolutely crazy. We tried to put him in a mental, mental institution. He was just saying some crazy things. And then everything he said came to pass. And now I'm a follower of Jesus. Shameless plug, we start a series next week because James wrote a letter to the early church as an eyewitness that we're gonna start next week digging into as a church. And so you're invited back. Shameless plug, all right? And then Paul. Paul is a really unique character. He was so against Jesus in that movement. He was a terrorist towards the church. He was murdering Christians, trying to shut it down, trying to shut it up. And eventually he would actually meet Jesus. His life would completely change. And he would become one of the number one writers of the scriptures that we have today. He wrote over a third of the New Testament. He, he planted tons of churches. So he went from trying to shut Jesus down to talking about Jesus and ultimately dying and being beheaded in the same way that James was beheaded for his faith. The reason that we believe Jesus rose from the dead is not because the Bible tells us so. There are historical documents in and outside of the Bible that give us verification for this eyewitness account. It's so much better. So what I want to do with the remaining time that we have is I want to look at Peter. Again, I relate with Peter a lot because, because he was so inconsistent. And so just to give you a picture of Peter, he believed in Jesus, and then he unbelieved in Jesus, and then he denied he ever even knew Jesus, and then he rebelieved in Jesus, okay? Like, all right, I can follow that guy. Like, if, if that's the pattern I gotta follow. He believed in Jesus, unbelieved, denied he ever even knew him, and then rebelieved. I'm like, this guy, I can follow. And so Peter writes a letter to the early church after the resurrection, and I want us to just take a glance into this eyewitness account as we uh, spend the rest of our time together. Verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's just a fancy way of saying God is awesome, okay? I know we don't talk like that, right? He's like, man, God is so awesome. That's what he's saying. He says, according to his great mercy, and God, God, God's got such an amazing love toward us. He has caused us to be born again. That's another fancy way of saying he's given us new life. Peter's saying, man, God's so awesome. Because of his love, he's, he's given us this new life and a living hope through the resurrection. A living hope. Listen, you need to know that that word hope is not a verb. It's not like a I hope so hope. Like, hey, following Jesus is going to maybe hopefully work out one day if I live a pretty good life. It is a, a hope in a noun, a living hope in an event. You say, Peter, what is it that, that gives you such a hope? Like, how do you know that God loves you? How do you know that you have new life? What, like, where does your hope come from? And then he gives it to us. He says, it's through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That's Peter's confidence. It's not his teaching. It's not a book. It's not what other people said. It's the singular event in history when Jesus rose from the dead. Peter says, that's how I know. And that's how I have a hope. He goes on to say in verse 4, he says th this God's love and this new life and this hope ultimately is pointing toward an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Who gets an inheritance? Kids get an inheritance, right? That's who an inheritance is for. And so Peter says, man, this is so cool. God's love is so great, and he's given us new life, and we have an incredible hope that is ultimately pointing towards an inheritance, something that God has for us. Well, if kids are the ones that get an inheritance, then this would, this would assume that God is relational. And over and over again, Jesus would teach about God as a relational God, one that you can know person, personally and intimately, that you can pray to, and he hears your prayers, that one, a God that wants to walk with you and help you navigate this life. And he's saying God is personal, and you can know him and have a relationship with him on an individual ba basis that, that is a daily, intimate thing. And he says that this inheritance is kept for you in heaven. And maybe you're like, man, that's another one. Like, okay, the resurrection's hard enough. Like, that's a big enough fish story. Now we're talking about heaven? Like, how do you even, what do you do with that? That's really hard to believe. And you know what? I think it was probably hard to believe for Jesus and his followers too. I bet it was hard to believe for Peter. Why? Because I, I think that... If, if you look at a, a little boy's Jewish life, Peter probably did not grow up hearing about heaven. 
And I think sometimes we think, oh man, listen, if you grew up around heaven, you grew up around that idea, then naturally you assume it's real. But then if you get educated or, or you get around people long enough that, and, and look at science, and you look at these different things, then that's just not a reality that you have to believe. That's for weak minds and weak people. And I want you to know that Peter didn't grow up believing in heaven. He probably wasn't taught that there was an afterlife as a little Jewish boy. There was a division in their teachings. And, and so some people said that there's something afterlife. And some people said, you just die. Like live the best life you can and, and give glory to God. And then you're just going to die. And so he didn't believe in heaven because he was taught about heaven as a child. Peter believes in heaven because of something he saw as a man. You see, the reason that he believed in heaven is because Jesus taught about it over and over and over again. And listen, when the guy that you saw die on Friday, you end up having breakfast with a few days later, you pretty much believe anything he has to say, right? <laughs> You're like, whatever you say. And so some of the really hard, heavy teachings that Jesus brought to the table, which by the way, there's a lot there's a lot of things that you look, and Jesus would teach you, like, man, that's really hard and really heavy to understand and, and be able to swallow, and, and this is what helps us is, okay, if the resurrection is kind of hard to believe, if we can get past that one, then okay, maybe what Jesus had to say about heaven is also true. So Peter is continuing to have this conversation, and he's given us a confidence and a hope for where his, his hope is coming from, and check it out in verse 6. He goes on, and he says, in this because God is awesome, because he loves us, because he's given us new life, and because we have a hope and inheritance and this life has meaning both now and forever, in this you rejoice. You get excited. You get pumped up. And, and so some of you are followers of Jesus in the room, and today is a big deal because you look back, you're like, man, my life is so different because of what we're celebrating today. And I can say that in all honestly. Man, my life is totally different because of what Jesus has done. And he says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. What's, what's Peter saying? He's saying, you can rejoice, you can, you can have joy even when life is hard. And those seem contradictory a lot of times. And maybe you walked in today and life is hard. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe you're having a hard time with your kids. Maybe you lost someone that you love recently. Maybe your job is not like it's, it's panning out. Maybe your relationship with your kids is not panning out like you wanted it to. I, I don't know what you walked in with, but maybe life is hard. And Peter is saying, you know what? We can rejoice even when life is hard. Peter's faith in Jesus, his, his belief in the resurrection, all of those things, he didn't doubt God's existence or love because of the trials and sufferings around him. If you were able to have a conversation with Jesus today, he would say, I saw the most incredibly painful and unimaginably hateful thing happen to one of the best people I've ever known. And then I saw him alive again. And Jesus said that God is good. And I believe him. If Jesus can go through all of that and still say God is good, then I'm going to go with Jesus. And so Jesus does not believe in this, I'm, I'm sorry, Peter does not believe in this imaginary God who never lets bad things happen. Suffering does not disqualify the existence or love of God. And this is so, so important. The resurrection reframed Peter's entire life. This singular event changed everything. Peter ran away from Jesus before and later would give his life for Jesus because of this singular event. Here's the last thing in verse 18. Peter wraps it up and he says, for you know, and he says this because he's writing to Christians who he's taught before, that they, they know what he's about to say. And he's repeating himself to remind them again. He says, you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you in inherited from your ancestors. Is that word again, inherited. He was talking about an inheritance that we get from God. But here he references an inheritance that we're born with. And he says, you know that God paid a ransom to save you from an empty life. And maybe you walked in today and you're feeling stuck. What do you need a ransom for but simply to, to pay to get out of that ransom? To, to get out of being held hostage 
And Peter's saying, you were a hostage. You were stuck in an empty life. And God paid that ransom to save you from it. And maybe you walked in and you feel stuck. Maybe the things that you've been chasing, the things that you're pursuing, no matter how hard you chase them, they simply don't fill you. They simply don't culminate in the things that you keep hoping that they will. And I can tell you honestly, today at 15 years old, that's what changed for me. Everything I was chasing continued to feel empty, and I was a hostage to my habits, to my emotions, to my mental state, to my patterns of behavior, and I wanted to be free, and I couldn't figure out how to get away from them. And then I met Jesus, and maybe today you're here for the first time you're hearing about God's love in a way that you haven't heard before. And he says, God paid to ransom you, to save you from that. And it wasn't paid with gold or silver, which lose their value. It was paid with the precious blood of Christ, of Jesus. His death on that cross and his resurrection three days later was the price that was paid for you and me to be brought back into God's family, to be brought back into a relationship with God. What's, what's Peter saying here? Here's what he's saying. He's saying this, that because of this truly remarkable event, we can know that God is for us because Jesus died for us, not because things always work out for us. Peter's saying that we can have a confidence, we can know that God is for us because Jesus died for us. That's the evidence. That's the proof. That's how you can know today that God loves you. He's proven it for you. And just because life is hard, and just because it feels empty at times, does not mean God doesn't want to meet you where you are today. And so this truly remarkable event that we gathered today to celebrate has incredible implications for for my life and for yours. Because of this event, this is how we can know that God is personal. This reality, this conversation we're having, we can know that God is personal, that you can have a relationship with God that infects and affects everything that you and I experience as we walk this life. And it's a now and forever thing. It's not just a later thing. We can know that suffering is not evidence of God's absence. We can have confidence that God is still good even when life is hard. We can know that heaven is real, which to be honest is sometimes hard. It's hard to swallow. It's hard to believe. You say, how can we know that? If we can can get to the eyewitness accounts of the resurrection and say, okay, if that happened, then maybe heaven is real as well. And we can start to wrestle with some of the hard things that Jesus taught like forgiveness of sin. You know what? Jesus, he, he would look at, he would be around a bunch of religious people and just make them so angry. And I love that Jesus, it was like my favorite thing ever when I read, and Jesus would just make religious people so, so angry. He'd be around some like blind people or lame people or crippled people, and he would look at them and he would say, your sins are forgiven. And the religious people would just be like, oh, you you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. You can't say that. Only God can forgive sin. And I think Jesus in those moments, he would smile. And then he would tell him to get up and walk or to see once again or to be healed. And Jesus would demonstrate externally what he had already done for them internally, that he can forgive sin. And so you and I can have a confidence because of the resurrection that there is forgiveness available, that we can be brought back into relationship with God because of his love. And ultimately, you and I can have a confidence that you and I, we are loved by God. God, and I want you to know that God loves you today. And so I don't know what you walked in with, friends. I don't know where you are today on your spiritual journey. I want you to know that we want to help you take next steps, whatever that might mean for you. And so there's a lot of things. Maybe you walked in and, and life is hard and you're going through a lot. Listen, I want you to know we have, we have city groups for a reason. It's so you can be around people who love you and are going to walk through life with you. And so you can sign up on a connection card to join a city group, share a meal with people, live life together, and be encouraged. Maybe you're here and and life is, is feeling stuck, and maybe you feel empty, and you're hearing about this relationship with God, and I want you to know the new life that that Peter is talking about is available. It's a gift that has to be received. 
And like any gift, it's already been purchased. It's nothing you do to earn it or, or to keep it. It's simply something that you receive. And I want you to know with confidence today, friends, if you don't have a relationship with God, you can have one today before you leave this room. Maybe you're here and, and, and you say, man, I want to be baptized. I want to I wanna make public what Jesus has already done internally and I haven't done that. Then you can sign up on your connection card. All of that's available for you. We'll help you take whatever next steps you are ready for. Maybe you want to find out more about City Church and how to get involved and plug in. And I want you to know it would be our honor to have you join this family as we continue to grow together, live life together, love together, and make a difference in our city. And Growth Track is that next step for you. So I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me right now. And as you bow your heads and close your eyes, this is just a private moment for you and me. Not a super spiritual moment. It's just a moment for you to block out the distractions. You don't have to worry about anyone else in the room looking around. And you can reflect on what God is doing in your heart right now. And maybe you're here and you walked in and life is hard. And I want you to know, man, it'd be my honor to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out make a big deal about it, but if, if life is hard and you would like prayer, would you just raise your hand with me and, I, and I'll pray over you in a minute. Would you raise your hands with me if life is hard and you'd like prayer? Great, I see your hands. Yeah, I want you to know God sees them too. God sees them too. You can put them down. Again, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you came in for the first time and you're saying, you know what, Drake, I'm not connected in relationship with God, but I want the relationship that you're talking about. I want to know God personally. I want to have a confidence in heaven. I want to have a confidence in a relationship with God. And if that's you today, I want you to know in the privacy of your own heart and mind, if it's genuine for you, God knows it and he'll meet you right where you are. You can pray in your own heart and mind today. God, I believe in you. 